Hello. <laughs> uh, good evening, and we are uh, saying hello from Make Amplify HQ, which is our shed. Shed, basically our <laughs> shed. That's what it is. Uh, we're going to discuss just a little bit about what we do, how we approach the work, the work we've done, and hopefully that will only be like 20, possibly 30 minutes. Um, and then we'll get to talk to you guys about all the things you're interested in knowing from us uh, in specific. Yeah, so we'd like to definitely talk to you guys more than we'd like to talk, if at all possible. Hello. So first of all, thanks very much, Laura and Susie and everybody at the Barbican for inviting us to come and be a part of your program. Uh, as she said, or as Laura said, we are mildly disappointed, significantly disappointed that we're not there with you right now. But uh, that's what we're all getting used to this year is how to roll with punches. Um, so we'll be there next February. It's going to happen. And we will talk some more about that at the end of this. But first, we'll do a little talk about what we do. And then we'll have a chance to chat with all of you, as Zach said. So um, as you said, I'm Jennifer Irons. I'm Zach Walker. And we are the co-artistic directors of Make Amplify. So we have some nice pictures. So um, this is us. We do lots of different things. And we'll just start about a little bit about our individual background. So uh, I'm a choreographer and a director and a performer. And I work in film, uh, theater, opera, outdoor site specific, and I'm a mass movement specialist. So I often work with very large casts and in uh, pretty crazy outdoor places. So this was a project a few years ago that that's 777 dancers in front of the Hotel de Ville in Paris. Um, so that's a little bit about my background. I am an audiovisual artist, uh, uh, among other things, and I uh, perform live with visuals and lighting in concert halls, dingy basements and festivals. I tend to uh, want pe to get people involved in the artwork I do and want it to be interactive and fun to play with. Oops, so that's us individually. And <clears throat> the team of Make Amplify is a collective actually. So it consists of us and award-winning artists and technologists and we create, so this is actually, we'll talk about this one later. This is the butterfly effect done with Digital Rebels. Uh, we're a collective that creates spectacular large scale outdoor immersive events. And we're really interested in doing things that transform people and public spaces into something extraordinary. Uh, we illuminate and reimagine city centers and landscapes, bringing forgotten ignore and ignored buildings to life and engaging communities and audience in life-affirming stories that celebrate being together physically, emotionally, and digitally. And we're part of the Quest Lab network, which is how we've met the lovely Laura Kriefman. Um, part of Fused Box at Wired Sussex, which is looking at emerging immersive technologies. And we were recently awarded the Superfuse Collaboration Award for our current research using augmented reality in performance. So we're going to show a little wee video. This isn't an official show reel, but it's just a few examples of some of the stuff that we do. Thank you. 
of some of the things that we have made and are making and basically what it breaks down to with most of the stuff that we do is that we're interested in uh, people and places and then amplifying the stories and the histories of those things so we're interested in people's stories and experiences and it's partly because real life is way more interesting than fiction or so we've learned um, and it's also one of the best parts about what we get to do is that we get to work with all kinds of people and often at the same time. Um, and we're interested in how people's experiences of where they've grown up or where they live or where they work affects how they see themselves and how they see their wider society. Uh, and we're when we're talking about places, uh, we're specifically talking about public places and spaces, uh, not in a theater, not where a temple of art happens, uh, because we're interested in art being available to everyone and belonging to everyone. We work from empty shops and community centers. Uh, we work in stinky pee alleys uh, and the back of buildings that are really famous, not the front of buildings that are really famous. Uh, so for example, this, uh, image that you're looking at here is a projection of uh, a bread factory in Hull that was torn down and it's projected on the side of the building next to the workplace and pensions, uh, Department for Workplace and Pensions. And this piece was about unemployment, youth unemployment. Uh, and then the last thing, or the last kind of main element of what we use is technology and the idea is that technology allows us to amplify those stories and those histories and and it's really important for us to to be clear that the people and the stories and the places come first and the technology is the secondary part to make it louder or bigger or to scale or to do something to be able to tell that story in a new and different way and bring that story to new people rather than starting with the technology uh, or sticking with just that. So you will never see anything that we make be 100% CGI. That is, that's not our bag at all. And obviously the tech isn't necessarily always really fancy. I mean, this is a very fancy headset, but most of our stuff um, uses found objects and we love old 80s cassette decks and things that you find in somebody's attic because old technology is actually just as interesting as new technology. So we're going to talk about this project in specific. So this is Apparitions. This is uh, a commission for the opening of the Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park. Um, we were commissioned by the London Legacy for the Olympic Park. Um, and they asked us to create a sense of ownership in a space that most of the people we work with have never set foot in, um, which, which meant that we had loads of cups of coffee and tea with lots and lots of people. Some of them were interested in what we were doing through some of the organizations in East London, like East London Dance. 
Um, others just walked by and wondered why we were doing what we were doing and what we were doing. Yeah, so the premise of the project, as I said, was to try to create a sense of ownership in the Olympic Park, where most of the residents who lived in Stratford, where the park was built, had very little sense of ownership of that place because most of them had never set foot inside the park. Um, and we'll get a little bit further along to talk about how geographically the borough was set up to really have a division between the new park and old Stratford. So we based ourselves out of this empty shop on the high street in the old side of Stratford. And we had people walk by, would poke their heads in, see what we were up to. And we just were asking questions, you know, what has it been like for the last seven years? What have you been up to? What kind of experience has it been for you? And on top of that, the room we were in was this, um, it was an old job center. So we had people coming in looking for jobs, thinking we were the job center. So we got all kinds of perspectives um, of people who were living there. And if you've never been to Stratford, it is, you know, one of the most diverse parts of the planet I think I've ever seen in my life. So the important thing about this for us is that when we go and work in a community or when we work in a locality, context is everything. So we're guests in that place. And the people who had lived there and had missile defense systems put on the roof of their buildings, had their buses rerouted, had um, all the roads ripped up. It was, it was, uh, wasn't necessarily always positive experiences that they were sharing. Um, so we were working with people from, we we're working with mothers and sons, grandparents, uh, a cleaner that was in the park, but never got to see an event. Um, and lots of people from different cultures, which is which was awesome and a great experience. And uh, one of the things that happens when you when we run a project like this is because uh, we create an atmosphere, and it's something we kind of pass by and don't mention a lot. But we expect people to be respectful and nice of one another, and we only accept that type of behavior on on our projects. Uh, it doesn't matter whether it's a professional. Uh, project with professional dancers and professional cameramen and all the rest of it or if it's uh, a community project with people who have never done anything before the expectation is that people are going to be uh, really supportive and respectful and nice to one another and because of that what happens is you also get a sense of community within the group that people who generally in some circumstances would 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 walk to the other side of the street to avoid each other start becoming uh enlightened that those people are just like them you know and uh that's really important to us that we start we don't do it by telling them look at the we don't we kind of we don't preach to them we just set up an environment where being nice to each other and listening to each other and understanding each other is inherently a part of the process um and that means that a lot of people get really excited to be around each other and by the end of it there's lots of hugs and kisses and uh, wanting to see each other and wanting to be around. And it's like a family is created in this, in this environment. Um, and that's really important to us about, about how, how we work and who we work with and what the result is. Because if you make an amazing product and the people had a miserable time doing it, it's a waste of time, space and energy for everybody. And certainly the opposite of what we try to accomplish with the work that we make. Um, yeah. Mm. So on this one, apparitions, we had the youngest person was little Nathan, who was seven. There he is. <laughs> uh, and I think our oldest was 79, although one of them, she said she was older than that, but it was none of our business what that actual number was. You can see Gladys in the front there laughing. Um, so the way that we got to this point is from those initial discussions that we had um, with people who just came into the shop, loads of cups of tea. There was a group of about 18 who kept coming back and wanted to stay and still be involved. And we started to workshop some of those stories that people had been sharing with us into movement phrases. And it's kind of like trying to tell a story without using words. And it's using movement to try to share a narrative or try to um, tell you something in the audience. But not once did we use the word dance. And there's a distinction for that. And the reason is that when we say dance to a lot of people who are not dancers or don't consider themselves dancers they instantly say that it's not for me and then they remove themselves from it and 
again, kind of hammering that point home, we're not interested in just working with professional dancers or professional performers. We're interested in working with people. So they all danced for sure by the end of it, but we didn't say that, we didn't advertise it that way. Um, so of the people who took part in this part of the project, some of them had been involved in the opening ceremonies and they were desperate to be involved with something else. Um, and some of them, as we'd said, had worked in the park as a cleaner and he'd never seen any of the events. And then some people who had no relationship it, with it at all. So after we get through the stories and we've created movement, we start to film. And you can see all of these white outfits that everybody's wearing and we film them under UV light. So that, that's a super high tech, right? We're using <laughs> like 80s, 70s, 80s UV lights and a camera, essentially. We black out everything with a load of black fabric, um, and that that was the tech for this event, or for, sorry for the for the creation of the content. Uh, we then used a projector and projection mapping to 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 make the piece uh, in situ, which was site specific. But um, you know, the tech for us, yeah, it was it's it's wearing white clothing, having a black light, and blacking the whole place out. So. You know, that's not very technologically advanced, but the result of what we get and the reason why we got there was um, we found that people, when they, when they, when you can't see their face and you can't see uh, the thing that we recognize most emotions and read most people's, uh, I think it's something like 90 something percent of communication is done through the face. When you take that element out, uh, people relax because they don't think they're gonna be noticed by someone else and recognized by someone else. And they start to just enjoy the process of movement and, and having have a bit more of an enjoyable time with it without being nervous and self, uh, self-conscious. Um, so it, it's, it, it's an element that we've used throughout our work because in a lot of circumstances, the time frames that we have to work with people and their availabilities is quite limited. So we need to make the most of that time and skipping over the bit where we have to do you know, getting them comfortable with their bodies and getting comfortable with cameras and getting comfortable. Uh, we skip a whole load of that by just uh, setting up a situation where they don't have to worry about those aspects. Um, and, and you know, for what we do, I think it's also, it, we've become a style and it, and it looks pretty cool the way we do it because we can, we can put those bodies just about anywhere because um, it's such a high contrast with black and white. When we project, uh, those bodies show up very distinctly. And then you have, this is Lorraine and her son, Nathan, who for her, she really loved that she was able to come and do this project. They could do it together. And she, uh, we get this a lot that people say, there's either something for my kids or for me, but not very often together. And this was, she said, she'd never had an experience like this with her own son before. And when we were doing the rehearsals and filming, we would put the videos up, the little sort of rushes at the end of the day on this screen in the window of the shop to show kind of what we were up to, but also to kind of advertise for the main event when it was coming. And the people who were taking part, this is all of them you can see, they won't go home at night. <laughs> So <laughs> we've just finished this rehearsal. We've just finished doing some filming with them and it's about nine o'clock at night or 9.30 at night on a Tuesday and none of them will go home because they're all too busy watching themselves on the video <laughs> on the screen. Whereas, you know, six weeks before that, it was this real kind of mission to get them to do the filming in the first place. So it was um, quite a contrast from day one to this moment. And then this is where we ended up. So the piece was edited together it was about 10 minutes long and we had an original soundtrack created by um, Dan Beats the composer who we work with a lot and the projections were sent 45 meters tall onto the Kofeli energy tower in the Olympic Park and it was so big that you could see them from the A10 motorway which was I don't know how far away but it, it was huge and effectively, we were trying to you know what we did do was place local people in this huge scale on a, a monumental building. And, and it was a place that's only reserved usually for, you know, the David Beckhams or all of the Olympic stars or those big billboards with Usain Bolt on them. And this was putting the people who live there on that scale inside the park itself. And the soundtrack was uh, downloadable online that you listened to through your headphones if you wanted to. And if you didn't want to, you didn't have to, but this just ran every night for a week. 
um, all night long, basically. And that was one of our first learning experiences and one of our favorite stories about double checking, triple checking, quadruple checking the night. So we did all of our tests. This is inside the energy center. And the night before the show was supposed to go up, the Olympic Park turned on the stadium lights in the Olympic Stadium and washed out our white figures uh, on a chimney like 100 feet away. So there was lots of late night scrabbling phone calls and calling in favors, um, trying to make it happen. So the whole idea of this was, the amplifying was, the amplifying the stories of the people who lived there, the physical amplification of the size of the people who were performing, And it also gave them, everybody who took part, the chance to see themselves in that way, 45 meters tall, dancing on the chimney, um, which I think is probably something most of us haven't ever really done. (laughs) So that's apparitions. Um, Zach's going to talk about the butterfly effect, which is something he's done with some of you, I think. Uh, Yes. So I I applied to, to be the digital artist for the Digital Rebels project. Uh, and they wanted someone who could, in, in in the way I kind of deciphered it was to work with the the digital rebels, the 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 artists on the project, uh, to create it, to kind of get to terms, and have an experience with technology that was positive. I guess is how I looked at it. And uh, I wanted to create. I talk, I spoke to them about their experiences. Not none of them had a lot of them. Um, so I wanted to create something that was playful and interactive and for them to connect with technology without having to go through like a course on how it all worked. Um, so I, I, uh, we set up in the theater, essentially a feedback loop with a camera and some lights and a few effects, uh, on, on a computer, but all of that was controlled by hand. I guess that's quite an important part in, in, in that each one of them had a knob to twiddle, a mouse to move or a camera to adjust and what what I was it was such a it was such a wonderful experience and such a wonderful afternoon within two hours of us starting they were confidently making beautiful art with something they never played with before and I was just blown away by it um how quickly they learned but how intuitively they were manipulating the imagery and manipulating the effects to come up with something that just turned it was just it was just gorgeous you know it was Laura and I were sitting in the back of the theater just watching half the time um being impressed by everybody everybody got involved the people leading the digital rebels uh, Susie um and they they couldn't keep their hands off the camera themselves because they wanted to play with it and it it was yeah it was just wonderful and it led us to uh the place we are now where Laura then asked us um what uh oh oh sorry i can't i'm I'm skipping ahead i'm quite excited about challenge accepted but now i'm going to play you the uh butterfly effect a little so this is the output uh from my computer of some of the effects that they uh some of the content they created Um, so the setup was pretty basic in, 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 well, in technology terms in that you had a camera pointing at a projector that was playing image that was being projected. So you get into a feedback loop where you see the, the thing that's being, uh, filmed is then being projected and then you film that and it turns into this wonderful loop where, um, you get many layers of an image over and over. One person was controlling the light and what color light was going on. The other was controlling um, the speed of the light. And um, the the third person was on the camera, moving it, zooming it in and out and panning it left and right. Um, the movement was beautiful. Their confidence, even within the time we were there, by the time we got to the end of it, was amazing. Um, it was just beautiful movement and filmed and and affected so well. Um, we all had a really wonderful time. As I say, I was super impressed by them. Um, right. Are we going to go back to us? No, we're going to go back to. Mm-hmm. Last page, 
screen share. Um, yeah, so now, so Laura, then um, after seeing this madness we created and how well it went, I think was, uh, we never worked together, Laura, um, who we'd met on the Quest Lab network, never worked, worked together. Um, we'd seen a bit of her work and she'd I think seen some you know examples of what we we showed but we never worked together and I think it went so well that they then asked us to come and do a master class and, and essentially we said no we don't want to do a master class <laughs> uh, but we want to we we want to make something and so then she asked us which is unique and it's never happened before well what's the thing that you never get to do that you really want to do um and that is just a amazing question to ask someone um and so what we came up with was challenge accepted uh which yeah which so basically we want to get to know plymouth um and we want to get to know plymouth with and through you and specifically not the plymouth that everybody knows about so this is a chance to reimagine a public space in plymouth using movement projection lighting and sound and the result being we want to make a multimedia installation and a live performance, and we want to make it with you. And as you can see, this wonderful picture here of Prime Skate Park, that public space is going to be Prime Skate Park. Um, we're super excited about this, and we are looking for people to join us who are creative and enthusiastic, and we're going to make something new, and it's probably going to be bonkers. Um, it'll definitely be bonkers. It'll definitely be bonkers. That is definitely our our stock and trade oh it can do the last one last one yeah so we'll just get this up for a second to say this is how to find us and um, we're going to talk a bit more about the challenge accepted in a moment with laura and susie but if you want to get in touch this is where we are emails websites social medias all that stuff do not go to our website right now <laughs> we are spending part of this year um updating all of that stuff so it's just just pretend like you never saw that uh and we'll just get to see you hopefully in february uh yes yeah so that was too much talking for my liking without someone else talking back to me i feel <laughs> really weird still even though we've been doing this for a long time i feel like i might as well be talking at a wall when we talk to ourselves in the shed uh, without anybody around but uh hopefully we can start talking about the really fun bit which is the thing that we want to work with all of you guys on to make um is there any specific questions uh not yet but i'm pretty sure there's going to be as soon as we start setting this up so firstly thank you both for telling us about your work it was really interesting to hear you talking about how you make work with people um uh, what that creative process is like with you, how collaborative that is, and what the outcomes are. That's why we were really interested in working with you again, um, and with the both of you, rather than just half of Make Amplify to actually yeah. get to damn straight. <laughs> oh, damn straight! The whole kid and caboodle um, is because that's really exciting, and from all of our work we do at the bar and and with Rebels, that's kind of key, right? That should be co-created. It's led by you guys. It's led by the participants. It's it's um, it's different, and we're finding new ways in which to allow people to find their own voice and new mm -hmm. platforms for that, and new ways for that to be celebrated. And part of that means we need to bring in new tools and new directions and play in different spaces. And you guys kind of know that you're seeing us doing that, um, and it's about to get amped up something extraordinary throughout the spring. Um, so. Challenge accepted will be happening from the 25th of February, which is a Thursday night. It starts at six o'clock on a Thursday night. And it runs until about, let's roughly say, 10 p.m. by the time we finish eating pizza on Sunday, the 25th, 26th, 27th, 28th. I knew I was about to get that wrong. Thanks. So it's the 25th to the 28th of February. It's three and a half days in which to make an entire new production that's going to take place 
at Prime Skate Park. We're working with Nick and the team there, which is brilliant. Um, and it can be involve uh, skaters and scooters and parkourists. There's going to be DJs. There is going to be projection mapping. There's going to be live performance. There's going to be whatever we choose to make in those three and a half days. That's the point of challenge accepted. We're gonna lay down a challenge. We're gonna lay down a location. We're gonna lay down an endpoint. And the rest is up to all of us about what we choose to make. Guided by the brilliant uh, Zach and Jen who are currently on this side of me. They're probably not for anybody else, but for me, that's where they're living tonight. Um, and we're really excited by this. This is like a ludicrous thing to do, by the way. Like, you know, the most- yeah, you worked it out, it's like 72 hours. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. So we've said it's going to be. Um, yeah. So it's like we're, we're working indoors and outdoors, uh, weird and long hours uh, and trying things we've never done with people we've never met and all in about 72 hours. So we expect it to be bonkers um, and as satisfying as it is exhausting, because that is one of the things why we keep doing this stuff is that when you get a chance to push our own ideas of what we think we can do with things and also what's possible it, it it's it's just incredible and the chance to do it with you guys and the chance to do it there is uh yeah we're pretty apt about it actually <laughs> we're let's put it this way we were crushed when we found out we couldn't do it like right now because we were so it was also as you all know we've been in rooms uh not making art uh well, we certainly have, and a lot of people haven't been able to make things and been creative, and that is uh, sucking our wills to live. Um, so the chance to make something was so exciting, and in this fashion where we got to do, it's so many things that I love personally. Like, I've been skateboarding all my life. Uh, the first, we, we realized the first piece mm. of uh, work that Jen and I made together um, was was a short film when she was going was to the place. Film. We a made skate, a skate film. <laughs> skate film. <laughs> And uh, what happened? Uh, and then I failed my dance and film course because there wasn't enough dance in it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I thought skate, but skateboarding is movement, right? Yeah. You can tell where it all went downhill from there, really. Yeah. You can tell why we we don't work in institutions. <laughs> that's, that's probably the, the the case. Is not enough institutions are wonderful like uh, the Barbican is, and that they want to do mad stuff that makes people think differently. Um, certainly not the place, in my humble opinion. Um, but I I find that. Um, so skateboarding is something I've done all my life and working at a skate park is something I've kind of been considering for about four or five years, but then I went to prime and it's just, oh, there's so mm. many awesome bits to it. There's so many possibilities within curves and lines and transitions that are just not, you know, they don't exist except for maybe on the rooftop of a domed church or something like that. You don't get, and it's the <clears> inverse. It's sort of the dip, the the opposite <laughs> way, and and it's inaccessible. Where a skate park is something that anybody can go to all the time. Ideally, you want to be on a skateboard or a scooter or a bike or something because you know that's what it's meant for. But I think the the opportunity that we also, when we were there last time, and Jen was super excited about, was <laughs> that most people don't get to walk around in skate parks because they're scared to go there because they don't think that they belong, and that's an interesting. Uh, dynamic as well is in it is having people involved in going up and down and feeling what that likes even walking um because it's just you know it's it the reason why the thing that i love about skateboarding and the reason why it's so exciting a lot of the time is because you're you're in a lot of ways you're defeat you're going with gravity and physics and you're sort of escaping for a second gravity and physics when you jump up in the air and go really fast and go like this for that split second that you're at the top, you're not affected. And that even that split second is incredible. So to be able to work with people who are really good at skateboarding and parkour and, and um, possibly on scooters and blades and bikes means that we can try to capture and, and distill those moments into like creative explosions around the park or i don't know like it's just there's so many interesting <laughs> ways um that was a bit much about skateboarding so zach likes skateboarding yeah uh i would also say that as well as having all of these different 
kind of ways of moving in the space we are looking for movers and dancers so if you're like hmm, well I've never been on a skateboard before but I would really like to jump off that or I'd like to roll down it then that would be great too um so we're looking for all sorts of different people that are curious about how how it might feel to move around a um a skate park and we're looking for people that have never moved before but would really like to learn a bit more about that <laughs> or would like yeah. to involved in film and we'll we'll have a chance for everyone to try all of these different things out but um you can come at this from any angle of interest or curiosity you have really and you mentioned the room that i want to learn how to do projection mapping and yet somehow you end up being our lead performer because yeah yeah, yeah. It, it happens that everyone just yes mate yeah yeah totes that's exactly what's going to happen for the next well, and and or both you know this is the thing is I think we're going to have a dynamic enough team that you could jump from behind the computer out onto the ramp and have your section where you've got to do the bits of performance or you're interested in performing and then jump right back up to the computer uh, and do that bit. And if you're incredibly multi-talented, you might jump on the decks, who knows, but, you know, and then make a piece of art on the wall. I think the, the, the idea we're trying to get through is that um, we don't know what we're going to make. And it's going to be dependent upon you guys because we're not going to say, all right, this is what we're going to do. We're going to look at all our uh, tools, look at all, all of our um, talent and come up with some interesting ways to approach what's what's possible and see if it works. And, and it will all turn out that it, it, you know, it will all work in the end. But we'll probably fail a bunch on the way because that's also what happens, um, <coughs> and that, that's perfectly fine. We'll speak to the park next door and make sure they don't turn on their stadium lights. Yes, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Totes. And and this is the thing. So what we're doing with this is we're giving ourselves permission. Um, we're giving ourselves permission to work with different people the same way as we have been doing with all of the youth training, that all the talent talent work we're now doing, but work with different people, work in different ways to be able to step three steps to the left and then five backwards and six round and then end up on your head and everyone be like, yeah, great. Uh, you know, that there isn't any, the, but what we're bringing together as an organization is a, a team of really great facilitators, <coughs> Make Amplify, uh, and really great creators, <coughs> including Make Amplify. Um, uh, 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 as well as some of the team we've got for Rebels Music, like uh, Benny who runs Granary Studios, um, uh, and and the skate park and Magic from um, the um, uh, Plymouth Parkour, and we're going to just go cool. It's about what we choose to do for those three and a half days. So it is a commitment, but it's a pretty epic outcome, and there'll be some kind of public performance at the end. And there may be stuff which is pre recorded, and we go, cool, this is an idea, and we've made it, and it lives, and that becomes a finite thing, which is why you might end up starring in a bit and then being doing live visuals on another bit. There'll be some stuff which is live, there'll be some stuff which we might film in the theatre, there might be some stuff which we make at the skate park. Um, we will find out from you guys as part of that. I think the this is the best question. Thanks, Julius. And um, when can you sign up? The invites to sign up, Susie, I think are going to be just after Christmas. Yeah, yeah. Well, so we'll we'll put some information up, but yeah, there'll be some invitations. And essentially, we're just asking you to email us and tell us why you're interested. Really, just to just to let us know what what you're up for and why you'd like to be involved. And that's as simple as that. And then we'll we'll select our we'll select our sort of team of participants and it's a limited number but we're really keen to find to find lots of new people to come and get involved yeah and the, and the, the most important part like you could have no experience doing anything ever before but if you're super enthusiastic about getting involved mm -hmm. uh you'll figure out that you're actually really good at quite a few things uh if you've never tried it before and i think more than anything like it's it's in my mind it's you know you go to festivals and you you or you go to events and you produce something in a tiny amount of time a fraction of time you somehow build something and make something happen and take it all down again and that process is so incredibly satisfying but it doesn't take expertise in most cases it just takes people who are willing to get on with it you need someone who knows what they're doing for sure and we will be those people there will be those people there um but if you want to get involved and you want to be a part of something,
that goes so much further than having like a particular skill because it a lot of time those skills don't kind of relate exactly to what we're doing so you need to sort of ignore that you know something anyways and just accept that you got to figure out how to do a bunch of other things you've never done before but the enthusiasm to do that uh is is the most important bit um and if you've got skills already then we'll try to incorporate it and they might come in handy but that's not i guess that don't put don't have it put you off if you if you haven't done anything like this before uh yeah Thank you. I've got a question for you for, for you both, actually. Um, I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit about how you've got to where you've got to, because I know that's something that a lot of our rebels, young rebels in particular, are always really interested to find out. I doubt you ever thought that you'd end up sitting in the bottom of your garden in a shed with loads of stuff around you, talking about a project that you're going to do in a skate park. But I just wonder where, how have you got to this point? What has happened to get you here? um in a in a kind of funny actually i think we absolutely always knew we were going to do something in a skate park yeah. that is the one bit i so when you guys actually said that when you guys actually said that in that discussion about where could this possibly take place and you said the skate park and both of us just went it is time <laughs> uh it's been on yeah so that's one part that i feel like it's it's sort of the confluence of all of our interests all coming together but we actually started to work together by a fluke so, um, as I said, so I've, my background is in dance and I was doing a site specific project working with an audiovisual artist who was based in South Africa and he was coming over to this project and couldn't get the visa or something happened. And then I was like two days before this happened, I didn't have anybody to do this project. And so I said, Hmm, are you, do you want to do this? <clears throat> so we did. And it ended up, it was a kind of a small first time we worked inside an empty shop. And that started this whole recognizing that we had lots of similar interests, but we were coming at it from two completely different perspectives. And we discovered things as we went along, like editing is like post-production choreography. So as a mover, I'm looking at dancers live and the way that people move live. And then you film it, you put it on the screen and he's got all these magic buttons that you can press and change everything that's happened and turn something upside down. And I'm going to cough again in a second. So that started us recognizing that we had a shared interest. And then from there started to get bigger projects and go to different things. Uh, if, you, if you're talking about how we got <coughs> to, it's kind of whether you want company or individual. I mean, as a company, I think, um, I think it's the from it's the not being in theaters bits. Yeah, I think no. that's a huge part of it. Is <coughs> I have loved art all of my life, and it has been the thing that got me through being uh, a kid. Calling, I got called a lot of names by a lot of people when I was a kid. Um, some very fair, but some of them not so fair. And it was definitely because I was that. Um, I was a kid who was sensitive, emotional, liked art, liked films, didn't like people being mean to each other and racist and liking guns. You know, I grew up in America, so it was, it was a bit harsh that way. Um, <coughs> but I always, and I love seeing art, but I always feel like when I studied more about it, I felt more and more, um, what's the right word? I felt more and more um, pushed away and, and like mm. the art, the study of art made me like art less or like artists, art institutions less, and like art less, like the big temples of art less. And so I wasn't, I just didn't want to make art that was put in those <coughs> places, I guess, because it felt like it wasn't, it wasn't meant, if it wasn't meant for me, then it also wasn't meant for a load of other people. And if that's the case, then they're, they're like, that's the opposite of what it's about. You know, art is something that makes you feel a lot of the times and connects you and makes you feel vitalized and if that's then if you're if you're saying that it's only for a certain group of people like what a bull what a bunch of bullshit like that is unacceptable behavior and so taking art and putting in places where people expect to buy stuff or to get services or things that they sort of walk by all the time the commonality of it the the fact that putting putting it in places where um you don't expect it means that you have a better chance of connecting to people I think in a lot of ways. And that's, that's, I think a lot of the make amplify uh, ethic is that it's more important to get 
to make it to, to create experience with people that don't feel that it's for them <laughs> than it is to make art for people who are definitely going to judge you they've already you got it and for be kind of shitty about it. what you're making anyways yeah. because they think they're they know what they're talking about when they you know no one no one knows more about art than someone else in terms of their taste and i find yeah so that that's something i find offensive i guess <coughs> is that um is that kids well grown adults and old everybody uh, there's a lot of people who have felt as though um they they don't understand it and i think that's like such a crazy thing that we somehow have educated people that they don't understand art like it's it's do you like it or do you not like it how does it make you feel that's all there is to it there's no understanding it there is context that can make things possibly have a understanding but it doesn't mean you'll like it anymore it just means you might respect it a little bit more but it doesn't mean it affects you you know um so that's a big part of it absolutely and a similar way to Jen and you and Zach, I agree that having worked in dance for a long time, just like you said earlier, Jen, you often, if you say that word, it puts people off straight away. Or if you say the word art, or if you say the word culture, it puts everyone off, doesn't it? Because it doesn't mean anything, or, and it's scary. But the fact that all of your projects are for anybody to take part in something that's so that would feel so specific and so specialist, but isn't, is really, really refreshing and I know that Lydia's just written in the chat that she, she says I just want to say this is amazing I'm so excited to hear about a project for everyone it gives us something to look forward to where, where we don't need to worry about being trained or being a certain age so that's really great so that's exactly what we want to do Lydia Lydia come and do it <laughs> we'll see you in February <laughs> and to me that's really important because the um one of the things I'm really aware of is that so when I um, I, like it's interesting Susie it's a great question to ask Jen and Zach but like there was there was no route to any any of the things that I have ended up doing mm -hmm. the only reason I've ended up doing any of these things is I get weirdly obsessed with the question and go off on a kind of like hands and gentle journey um to explore something and end up learning a load of stuff and meeting a load of people and had just enough confidence to be tenacious enough to ask those questions and figure out where the teeny tiny place that I could start off in those conversations could be. Mm -hmm. um, but unless you've got the confidence or had the chance to do that, the, like the permission for, around that, I was lucky at my school, there was um, a set of teachers who when you came up with a harebrained idea, anybody, when anybody came up with a harebrained idea, they basically went, great, if you can figure out how to do it. Do it, yeah. yeah. But that's yeah. increasingly rare. Yeah. And so what I'm really excited about with the challenge accepted is basically that's our starting point. We've got a location, which is a boundary, and we're good with that. Like, boundaries are good. Like, yeah. having, a, yeah. having a, a, a potential edge. Um but you know we've got a location we've got a time limit and then we've got brilliant people who are going to be yeah. in the room, and the people who are in the room are the right people yeah. and therefore that's that potential to just be like cool we start and we see where we end up rather than having to make it we have to get to an end structured show we'll do that there will be other opportunities for that as well susie and i can talk to you about that another day but this is a really exciting opportunity to not have to hold things so tightly and to go, what's our question? What's our starting point? What is it about this space that excites us? And what tools have we got in our tool belts to animate that space? Because there'll be more things that you guys all bring to the room than, than we have. Well, and likewise with working with you guys there and whoever takes part is, you know, we don't have the answers to this. We don't know what's going to happen. We don't have it figured out this is what's going to be on the end of the Sunday night, the thing that's been made. And I think this is actually what one of the greatest things about having this job, whatever you want to call this job, is that we don't have to have all of the answers to things. And that's the part that makes it so amazing is you're figuring out what those answers are. Sometimes, sometimes you never quite find it. But the whole point is that you're trying to find them with other people and with people who have a completely different perspective on something and they'll come up with an idea. It was like, oh, I never even would have thought of that. And that's the part that kind of ultimately is the reason for doing it in the first place is you're trying, or at least for me, is trying to understand the world better. 
So by doing this and getting to do it with different people, you know, we're learning all the time. Like we don't, you know, it's, I always laugh when people introduce us and they use like the word expert. I just feel like it's the funniest, you know, I'm like, where, where, like who's let them in? Because we're so, we, every single thing that we do is kind of the first time we're doing it because it's the first time we're doing that thing. So yes, we've made a film before. Yes, we've made an installation before. Yes, we've worked together before, but we've never done Challenge Accepted in Plymouth. And so this is going to be like, I, you know, that's the part that's exciting. So. I think it, it's a faith as well that yeah. like I, I've, got, <laughs> I've got a huge amount of faith um, that everybody mm -hmm. can do anything. It just, if you're not good at it, might take a lot longer, but that's no reason not to do it. You know, like who cares if you suck at something, if that's what you want to do with your life or that's what you want to do with a portion of your time and energy and on earth and just do it. And you might have to w work 10 times harder than the person whose talent in one finger somehow makes it happen immediately. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. And I think that's the starting point for most of, like I work a lot with young people as well and always will because I want to encourage young people and, and, and say to loads of young people, that's amazing. That I really am impressed by that because not enough young people get that, you know, and not enough young people. And I get, I'd argue, I say age, not enough people, people get that, but yeah. I, I find young people are the most malleable in that you can, <laughs> you can possibly influence them in, in a much greater way because they don't have the insecurities built up that us adults and older people do that you have to bash down a lot to, to get to. Um, but it's, it's really important to me that, like when I talked to, when we did the digital, uh, when we did the, butter, what turned into the butterfly effect, um, I had every confidence that everybody in the room could do everything I've done, essentially, like everything I know I could teach you guys in like five to 10 minutes and you would be able to do as good a job, if not better, because you also don't have all the baggage that I have with all of it that I've had beforehand so that you can just go, oh, let's try this. And I'm like, you can't, oh, well, maybe you can do that actually i don't know i've you know like that's the thing about working with other people and collaboration being a, a an essential part is that when you're working with someone who doesn't know how it works the opportunities within that are so much greater than working with experts because they're the ones who aren't going to have walls around them that 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 are going to stop them from moving out <clears throat> you know that are moving up and moving around um and that's just, you know, it, it, I guess it, it's something that will, it will mean that we're, we, we never want to do the same thing over and over again. I guess that's the thing. We don't want to make a show and then even tour it around, a, <laughs> like tour it around a theater in a sense. Like I want it to be every time I do it, it's a slightly different version of it. Or if it, if it is that type of show. Um, but with something like this, like if you're doing a site specific piece of work, then there's nothing that you know. Like you, you have to start over with every bit. You have the same equipment, but it doesn't matter because it has to be rearranged in all these different ways. Um, and you're inspired by different, by different elements. Like walking around that skate park, I was super inspired. And I've got loads of ideas, but none of those are going to be what happened. But they're going to be good starting points to talk to other people about. Yeah, absolutely. A big giant space of possibility. Mm -hmm. That's great. I'm with you. We've had another question come in um this question is asking it's two questions it says when do you think that technology or dance overshadow each other in a project so perhaps there might be an example of where that's happened or you've had to make a decision mm -hmm. and the second question is how do you strike a balance between the two probably with a giant argument maybe not <laughs> uh... I would like to take this one, please. Um, so I see dance get overshadowed by technology all the time, all the time. Um, and it is, you know, I try not to be rude about other people's work in general because we're all making and we're all creating. And I think there's a place for that everywhere. And I'm glad that people are doing it. <laughs> From my own personal opinion, where I where I don't enjoy it so much is when I feel like it's become a gimmick and it's being done to just show that you could. And it's that, it's that Jurassic Park thing, you know, where Jeff Goldblum says, you've been so busy trying to see if you could, you never stopped to ask yourself if you really should. And that's this thing of, um, I get bored. So, and, and, and I feel like it happens often around when I talk to other people about it is that you lose the point of what that thing was about. And I feel like, 
my love of art or why I'm interested in it is because it enlightens me about something, it makes me feel something, it teaches me something, or it gets me to think, or just, you know, affects me in a certain way. And the ones where the technology takes over, for about 10 seconds, I go, huh, that looks interesting, cool, yeah, oh, they were just, oh, okay, and then I'm bored, and it doesn't do any of those things anymore. So, I'm not saying that we're not guilty of doing that ourselves. We have gotten into a studio and been like, oh, that looks so cool. And it does sometimes look really cool, but then that's it. In terms of the work that we want to make, that's why we're really adamant that it always starts with the person or the story or the history or the narrative or the thing that we're exploring. And then the technology is there to help us tell that story or emphasize that point or enhance that feeling or expand to a bigger audience or do that thing. Um, and I think it's a very tricky trap that we all fall into from time to time because some of the stuff does just look really cool. And we're in right now um, spending a lot of our time looking at augmented reality is what we're working with now mostly. And we are constantly going, that looks really cool. Great, but what does it mean? And that's a question that we come back to over and over and over and over again. If it doesn't have a meaning and if it doesn't make meaning, then it's not, we don't use it. And that's why we have hard drives full of really cool looking things that we haven't found the right thing to use those cool looking things for yet. And when it comes, we'll know it's that thing. Um, I say that like we haven't made awful stuff that's just like loads of crazy tech stuff going on because we've done that too. Um, but yeah, that's but my not. But we usually. But I think the thing is, is Lost it's time. it's um, it's what is for public. I so my my take on it is, um, I agree with everything that Jen said, and that I find um, that there's things you do by yourself, <laughs> and and artists need to have a line in my mind if you're sharing with the public. Not say that people shouldn't do other things. This is my opinion. But if you're going to share something and go out into public with people, then if it's up your own ass and doesn't mean anything to anybody else, who cares? You know, like I have seen so much dance and technology and technology and dance and art in general that is so self-involved that there's nothing wrong with that art. It's just when you present it in the public, to me, there's a there has to be a line. There has to be a differentiation in in your in your decision making about what's sharing with other people that you want them to be a part of it because that's why you're putting in public and what's just showing off some stuff you've done. You know, like that doesn't that that to me is <laughs> Laura really... wants to say Laura. <laughs> I agree, but I say and I often think about it about process. So there is a point where you have to get past when you're working with technology. This is from my experience and the way I usually frame it for people is that um, you have to get past the tricks until it's just a point where it's a tool in your belt. Mm -hmm. Now, in the point of doing the tricks, you lose the, you end up in the shiny, shiny, the flashy, flashy, the, the whiz bangs. Um, when it becomes part of your tools and it's in your tool belt, you, you are focusing on what's that relationship with the audience? Who are we telling the start? Who's the, where's the dialogue? Who are we telling stories to and everything else? And the, sometimes because we're often making the commissioning process or the processes or the way people are approaching stuff is they get stuck on the shiny shiny they go that's the first effect it's great we're just making with that and they've not interrogated it further what's interesting with you guys is that you have over your careers interrogated that further and you understand that that's a genuine point in the process but that's different to necessarily what how it appears on on stage and in real life and where that dialogue point is between the audience and the movement and the technology. Yeah. I like to sit right in the middle. I like all three to be fully transparent and visible at all times. Mm -hmm. um, other people live in different places and are, and are interested in different, different nuances in that triangle. But I think that that's where that that's where I think what you're talking about there is really interesting is that the the exploration to get things to the point of being a tool in your tool belt so yeah. that you then think about audiences and your storytelling yeah. really we have things that I can't wait to use yeah but I have to <laughs> <laughs> I have to I have to wait because it is so good that when it finds its place out in the world to share 
it's gonna be amazing. But if I just put it out there now, it's gonna just be amazing for a second. You know, yeah. like it'll just be something that people are like, oh, that's oh, all right. Yeah. You know, and I and I expect more. You know, you you need to invest in those things properly yeah. and have patience. Um, yeah, but yeah, that's that's that. I think that's mm -hmm. probably. I've got a question for you. I don't know what the answer is. I'm just curious. Where does spectacle fit in all of this? Because there's an element, not of self-indulgence, but of sort of, that's cool. Mm. That's going to wow a group of people. Where does it fit in? Because surely that's an element to it. You know, you wouldn't put people, uh, what you know, moving bodies on top of a chimney in a building if you didn't want an element of spectacle. So where does that sit with you guys? So I think that the spectacle is what allows us to share those stories in a way that elevates. So that's part of the amplify. That is part. So there's the very literal, we amplify it by plugging it into something electric, but then there's the amplify of hearing the story about the guy who was the cleaner working in the Olympic park and then never set foot inside the park. Other than that, that, you know what I mean? You could read that in a magazine, and you might read that and go, oh, that's kind of a shame that he worked there and he never got. Or you can put him 45 meters tall on top of a chimney and see him from the A10 motorway and you go, holy cow. And I think part of the spectacle, you know, first of all, the. We love spectacle first in, in the right place and time, but it's that whole thing of scale of stuff scale. We're really interested in scale. So we do stuff really, really tiny as well, but it confuses our company blur <laughs> so, so that's part of it but the spectacle elevates when you put something that big it makes it seem important and we think it's important already anyways but by doing that and making it that big and putting it like in lights and and you know it makes us look at that stinky pee alleyway with a different set of eyes because that space has been animated and lit and it's come alive and I might have walked past that space every single day of my life and never paid any attention to it. But now because there's light on it and there's sound and there's spectacle, I'm looking at it in a totally new way. And that's one of the things I think we're really, really interested in is how we elevate those stories or amplify those stories and experiences so that you hear them. They're t you're hearing them, but it's just making it easier. And then it makes that space or that story have weight and, f and be, um, and, and, and being told that it's important. A lot of people that we work with don't think that their story is important and it is. And by putting it up there, out there like that and making a spectacle with it without hopefully making a spectacle of ourselves, although that does happen, um, it gives it, I'm not finding the right word right now, but it gives it them, it's a platform, the significance that it deserves. That's, yeah. I think, yeah, I think we reserve it for, I guess that's, that's our, that's our, our thing is about, um, there's enough money thrown at famous people who, and, and rich brands and like, you know, all the things you ever see in bright lights that are huge and shiny are almost always selling you some shit you don't need and promoting something that's unnecessary and i think that when turned around um you can as jen said just make people think about their surroundings and the people around them in a different way and i think like no i think your train thing you know i think to me that's that's quite a spectacle but that's you were working with people who I don't even know the right word, like drove cranes. Like, you know, they, they worked cranes. Those aren't performers who are in usually a limelight, you know, like they're not the ones who are, and I feel like it's the same, it's the same interest is enough about the rich people and the famous people and the big companies that are selling a bunch of crap. What about using this opportunity to talk about everybody and the people who you live around and that are important, they're more important than any of those people because they're the ones that you live next to and you talk to. And if you get to know, you'll probably, you know, not all the time like them, but at least you'll have a modicum of respect for them and, and won't be shitty to them, you know? And that's, and that is more important than anything they're selling you. Like that stuff doesn't matter. 
it'll die, it'll go away, it'll break, and it will be buried. But the people you know and the um, experiences you have with those people will live with you forever. And so that's the important thing, you know? And so spectacle can give those, in our mind, spectacle is about an opportunity for that to, to exist. And to see ourselves in a different way. Watching the guys when we did apparitions in the Olympic Park see themselves on that chimney and recognize each other, you know, because we couldn't see the faces and they would go, oh, it's you, it's you. And the their reaction of what it was like to watch themselves on that massive thing was amazing. You know, that's, you can say to somebody, you're important and your story is interesting and what you say is interesting and I want to hear it. And then you can put it on that massive thing and have people see it. And that's, that, that says it, it the whole way. Home, you know, yeah. it, 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 it makes the point. Yeah. yeah. And if you, uh, if you could get anybody to watch Challenge Accepted at the end of Challenge Accepted, who would that audience be? If we could get anybody into the, uh, the, the skate park has unlimited capacity. <laughs> And um, uh, there's no COVID restrictions, and uh, we could get anybody to come and see this project at the end of it. Who would you love to be in that building watching it? It would be the kids who don't like skateboarders and parkourers, and and maybe those people, maybe the people that shout at me and give me bad looks from skateboarding by, like I'm gonna kill them. It, it, for, at the top of my head, the people who are judgy about those those kids are gonna break everything and their vandals and their blah 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 i mean it's less so than when i was a kid you know all these things are much more acceptable now but i still feel as though people are giving me shit for doing something i love and i think you know maybe people who um don't understand it <laughs> maybe that's the best group of people to come see it because they might be uh, impressed at the depth of um, not the depth of skill, but the depth of sort of commitment. I think that's the thing that people don't get about the arts and about things that you have to put a lot of time into is, or, or that are really hard, I guess, like, is that people don't do it and make money out of it. None of us make enough money out of this to make it a worthwhile thing to work as hard for. We do it because we love it and we do it because we're obsessed with it, you know? And that is something that you should, I think people should appreciate rather than be like, why are you wasting your life doing this thing? That you're never going to earn any money and you're going to hurt yourself doing it, you know? Um, so that's one group I'd say off the top of my head, but I'd probably be more informed if I thought a little bit more about it. <laughs> I think it'd be really interesting to actually see people who would never go there otherwise. So if you have never shown any interest in um, partly the skate park, but also partly going out to like somebody who wouldn't ever maybe go into a theater, somebody who wouldn't necessarily think that actually a show maybe somebody who even goes what the heck is an installation i don't even know what that word means and and as and as much those are also the people that we want to actually do the project yeah. so i i think it's pretty part of it we want to make sure is that when we say we want to work with people we don't mean we're just working with everyone who understands what projection mapping is or anything like that so i think the audience and the people we're working with are hopefully the same people and um, but yeah i you know i really like I'd really like to see somebody there who hasn't gone to see anything in town before. And I don't know who that is. So when you come, come and introduce yourself so we can meet and have a tea. That, that sounds just like a challenge accepted, which is a terrible, terrible link to the beginning <laughs> of this whole Zoom show. But that's a challenge accepted. Okay, I, we should do our best to bring people that would have never been there before. And I know Prime will be very happy with that as well because they're all about bringing different people into skate culture and into their building and mm. giving them a chance to have a look. It's much more, I, I, I'd say for both the arts and <laughs> skateboarding culture, um, it's much scarier than it, it's much less scary than it looks, you know, like. We got a lot in common, I think. Yes. <laughs> we got a lot in common. And, yeah. and uh Oh, it's about get well it's about getting involved i think that that's the yeah. thing it's about getting involved if someone it, it's the same in in my mind it's the same in the arts when you're on the right people as it is in the skate park if someone is trying to skateboard for the first time or do a really basic trick they get just as much 
encouragement and um, confirmation and applause or, you know, congratulations mm -hmm. to the person who's doing the most complicated trick and lands it. Yeah. That, that can be said in the arts as well. Is if you see someone do something for the first time that they've never tried, they're not comfortable with, and they do it, mm. you're just like, that was amazing. Well done. That's super hard. Or just like thumbs up, you know, because skateboarders are a bit cool like that. But they're still <laughs> going to encourage you to do it because they're stoked that you're trying. And I think that's what it's about is if you're trying to do something that's really hard, that's enough. That's the bit that's that's the bit that's worthwhile. Whether you do it or not, whether you make it or not, and, and how well it goes doesn't really matter. Um yeah, yeah, that's that's it. Absolutely. I've got one final question to you, and it feels like you've almost answered it already. Which and we're asking all of the different panelists and things this question, which is what does the word rebel mean to you? Hmm. Because it's an important word for here us at the back. We know for an answer. Say that again. Not accepting no for an answer. Mm. Yeah, just that's it. Yeah, yeah. Great. My mother is freaking out when I say that. <laughs> if you're if you're one of those people that your mother used to say, what part of the word no don't you understand? You too could be speaking to everyone from your sh garden shed. <laughs> yeah, I think it's just not taking no for an answer, really. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I think that's a, a really lovely note to end on. Um, so on behalf of myself and Susie and all of the team at the Barbican who have been uh, uh, letting us know how much they've been enjoying this talk and, uh, and um, we just want to say thank you. We cannot wait to work with you in February. It's going to be totally, utterly aces. So to remind everyone again, we will be opening up the application process um, in January. It is not a hard application process. It's just about you saying why you want to be in the room with us. It's going to run from the 25th until the 28th of February. It's Thursday night and then it's all day, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. You've got to do it all. It will be worth it. Um, and we're going to be creating something extraordinary that's going to be performed at Prime Skate Park. Um, with the fabulous Jen and Zach from Make Amplified and loads of the brilliant, brilliant Rebels practitioners who you've probably met over the the, um, the last term. So um, applications make, can be voice or video as well, right? They're not necessarily have to. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Movement projection, voice, video, <coughs> any reason and any reason why you'd like to be involved in challenge accepted. You might be a visual artist, you might be a graffiti artist, you might be a skater, a scooter, a parkourist. We don't mind. You're all welcome. Join us. Um, uh, so we will be keeping an eye on all of our socials and we will let you know how and when to um, get involved. Um, but we're really well, really looking forward to getting um, uh, Jen and Zach into Plymouth proper for some uh, uh, ludicrous making and probably a lot of pizza eating. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And noodles. Thanks, so much. Thanks for having us too. <laughs> Thank you. We'll see Thank you, you. Uh, in February. Yeah, okay. absolutely. Thanks very much. Thanks everyone for coming. Yep. Thank, Thank you everyone. Bye. Bye.